and hello everyone thank you so much for joining me today as we go down the rabbit hole and take a look at some of the unusual applications of genomics. Today we are going to be talking about the Woolly Mammoth Project so Ariona if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Thank you Shannon I'm happy to be here. My name is Ariona Haisoli I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the lab of George Church at Harvard Medical School and I did my PhD in stem cell biology. So you've probably kind of discussed this um, a, a lot, <laughs> but it'd be kind of just great if you just briefly kind of summarize what the Woolly Mammoth Revival Project is and kind of what you are trying to achieve, essentially. Yeah, uh, I think I'm going to give a little bit of background first. So uh, the first sequence of the Woolly Mammoth came around 2006, where they sequenced the mitochondrial DNA. And then later on, genomic DNA. Um, and we have now sequences of several woolly mammoths. Um, but I think uh, it's mostly, so the fact that we are here and discussing this topic is probably because the pioneering thoughts of my professor, George Church, he, ever since the sequences of ancient uh, species came along, especially woolly mammoth, he was interested in using genome editing tools uh, to revive the species. And uh, this in combination with some other work from Sergei Zimov over at Northeast Science Center in Siberia. He was very much interested in uh, reviving a lost ecosystem uh, of um, the woolly mammoths, which was grasslands, very biodiverse. Um, and he actually has a piece of land uh, where he's trying to actually test uh, his hypothesis um, in real life, where he tries to make uh, a very biodi biodiverse environment in order to see whether increased uh, vegetation and biodiversity could uh, be the key to uh, slowing down um, global warming, or at least the effects of um, global warming uh, in the future. And so in the lab, what we do is uh, we take elephant cells and um, we try to use a, a variety of genome editing tools in order to change the sequence from the uh, sequence of the, the elephant to the sequence of the woolly mammoth. We have obviously done a lot of background work on comparing the sequences of a lot of um, African elephants and Asian elephants to the current uh, genomes we have from several specimens of the woolly mammoth. So we have compiled a list of changes. Mostly they are just single nucleotide changes that disperse throughout both the, the coding regions and non-coding regions of the genome. And we focus on uh, several genes that we think are associated with some of the phenotypes um, that gave the woolly mammoths um, the ability to withstand cold temperatures. And so we hope to engineer those features into um, uh, an elephant cell. What is the kind of ultimate goal of this project and kind of where might it be useful within society? Yeah, so I think we see this as a sort of like a pilot or a landmark um, genome project right that is we would like to see um, how we can use the current technology for conservation efforts or for restoration of lost ecosystems by bringing back some of these uh, lost species now there are caveats of course we cannot do that with uh, every lost species um, obviously the woolly mammoth we they roamed at least uh, an isolated island in siberia as recently as four to five thousand years ago so the ecosystem is similar to what it uh, used to be, and it's possible to revive the species and um, basically return it to the ecosystem it used to live in, because a lot of it has been preserved. And so, but I think in the future, as we face, due to human uh, animal encroachment, poaching, due to uh, climate change, we are losing um, species at an alarming rate. So we would like to, uh, build a framework of how we can return or revive some of these species and preserve, preserve biodiversity in the future. What other kind of animals are being looked at in terms of like de-extinction in projects? Because obviously you're kind of focusing on the mammoth. What kind of other ones yeah. are there? I strongly recommend people to look up um, this nonprofit organization called Revive and Restore. Uh, they have listed there the projects they are interested in. Um, I think that includes the so it's a combination of trying to uh, increase um, genetic uh, variability in some of the species that are uh, threatened 
or uh, undergoing extinction and also reviving some of the lost species. For example, the complete revival would be the woolly mammoth or the passenger pigeon. But there are also projects like um, the heath hen um, or the Schwalski horse um, or the black-footed ferret. These are uh, projects with species that are still uh, alive, but we can uh, increase genetic diversity so that we give them a chance um, and they don't go extinct. What are kind of some of the, the kind of sort of dangers of bringing back essentially animals that we have, we have made go extinct? Yeah, we definitely need to have uh, ethical discussions on bringing back lost species. I think in, the, in our lab currently, we we're work, working at the in vitro uh, uh, model with uh, cells. Uh, when we get more advanced and we move on to potentially um, bringing back the, an actual uh, fully grown animal, a lot of conversations have to happen. I think there are several things you have to consider. First, is there an ecosystem for the lost species? Um, and we believe at least for the woolly mammoth that there is because they've, they've only recently been uh, extinct. Obviously, we cannot talk about bringing back something uh, or an animal that um, we lost millions of years ago for many reasons, primarily because we don't have the sequence. Obviously, you need to have the genetic information of the lost um, species. And for the woolly mammoth, uh, we have a lot of uh, specimen that are well preserved. So we're able to build the construct the whole genome. Yeah. A lot of people, for example, ask about the dinosaurs, but sadly, we don't have genetic information for dinosaurs. So we cannot rest assured that at least now it's not quite possible to bring back the dinosaurs. We're talking about hundreds of millions uh, of years ago and um, DNA is uh, withstands a lot of degradation over time, but it's not that robust. So you have to have the genetic information of the species and also you need to have the ecosystem as I uh, talked about and uh, for the woolly mammoth we do for some of the lost species uh, it's no longer there. So in that case you really have to discuss um, the feasibility and whether it's a good idea to actually bring back a species that has no um, habitat. Yeah. So these are some of the factors, along with, of course, the ethical discussions of bringing back species um, that we believe are more complex, such as, uh, for example, a woolly mammoth or elephant, in which case we have to consider their well-being in nature. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of dinosaur lovers are going to be very heartbroken <laughs> about this news. <laughs> I mean, a few a few months ago, they um, I think a record was broken for sequencing the oldest ancient genome from like the t the teeth of of a, of a mammoth. What are some of the challenges that you've experienced, kind of working working with this material? Yeah, so I think some of the challenges for sequencing ancient DNA are the specimen itself. So you, obviously the better preserved the specimen, the better sequences you will get. Um, we have obviously sequenced uh, even, um, you know, um, specimen from our own species uh, like Homo neanderthalis, um, Denisovans uh, and so on. And it's been a bit more challenging there because all you have is bone. So you have to grind a lot of bone to get uh, some, um, some DNA from the specimen. We have been a bit more fortunate with the woolly mammoth that there are so many of them uh, preserved in the perma permafrost. But obviously, you, if you want to get as um, as good quality a sample as you can, you want to keep um, to keep it pre preserved and frozen during transportation. Um, one other major challenge in uh, sequencing ancient genomes is contamination of the sample itself with the flora and fauna of the environment where it's found. So most of the sequences, most of the DNA sequences from those samples are actually contaminant DNA. And this also includes uh, con uh, human contaminants because of uh, during handling. Um, PCR is actually very sensitive. Uh, it's a very sensitive technique. So you can actually sequence very well, even one molecule of DNA. So you have to be wary of uh, contaminants. And while sequencing ancient uh, genomes, you can actually go through an enrichment step where you try to use uh, strands um, that are similar or that are going to be um, uh, complementary to the sequence you will find so as to enrich it from uh, the contaminants uh, found in the in the specimen itself. That way you increase the quality 
um, and you enrich the reads you want. After that, usually the DNA is highly degraded and deaminated, so some of it may not sequence well. So you have to go through a repair step um, in order to um, get the DNA to sequence well. And then uh, attach adapters or these universal sequences that can be used to amplify one specific molecule many, many times, hundreds to thousands of times. And you end up with these short fragments of DNA you don't get much information from those. So obviously you need computational tools and programs to stitch them together uh, in silico. So that's what happens next. You have all uh, variety, uh, millions of these short reads, and then you actually try to stitch them together. And you can only go so far, of course, um, especially with novel species, you actually have to build a genome de novo. But in the case of the woolly mammoth, it's great because we have a very similar a genome in the elephant. So you can actually use the elephant genome as a scaffold. So you can use, uh, you can stitch these smaller fragments into contigs that are longer and then try to use a scaffold um, genome of the elephant. So you can actually uh, map where these sequences are and try to find out more information, whether it's coding or non-coding, whether it's a gene, whether it's a regulatory region, or whether it's outside of those uh, altogether. So it's a it's a, it's a science, it's a, it's a field um, that is kind of separate and a lot of advancement has, uh, has been made there uh, to make it possible now to mainstream sequencing of ancient samples. Because it's obviously it's a bit definitely more challenging and more difficult with old degraded DNA than with fresh DNA. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that your lab is kind of working on an elephant mammoth hybrid. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that you kind of use the elephant genomes to kind of help you with that. How kind of similar are, are those genomes and are there kind of any notable differences bet between them? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously theoretically you can also, or just by looking at the, um, the uh, image of a woolly mammoth versus an elephant, you can clearly see differences in morphology. Um, and I think, We've estimated that it, uh, the sequences, the closest organism, uh, that uh, the closest uh, similarity in DNA a woolly mammoth has um, to any other species is actually the Asian elephant, uh, roughly 99.6% similar. And from our uh, computational work, we've estimated that there are around 5 million changes throughout uh, the genome. So we have to make basically 5 million changes to drive a, or, or sort of like a base elephant without, of course, the genetic variation that happens between individuals. Um, so, but roughly we estimate uh, we have to do five, uh, 5 million changes first. Yeah. Would you be able to kind of discuss some of the, the techniques that you're using to create these hybrids, like some of the kind of in vitro um, work that you're, that you're doing? Yeah, the field of uh, gene editing has uh, advanced pretty fast. So we use CRISPR-Cas9 and it's derived uh, variations like base editors where you make a single base pair change um, that is pretty precise. Obviously there are off-target effects, but I think it's one of the best tools we have as well as prime editing where you can actually insert or delete small um, uh, small sequences. So these are some of the major tools we use now that we've only, we're only focusing on a few genes. Later on, as you as you increase the number of edits, um, we, you need better tools. We don't have great tools. We have good tools. Um, I think it would be a combination. We would have to also use a combination of uh, synthesis, assembly, and then swapping into the elephant genome. Um, so for example, if you need to make many, many changes in a particular locus of DNA in the elephant cells, and you find that there are so many changes that maybe a base editor or CRISPR is not exactly the most efficient tool there, uh, we predict that we can actually synthesize that fragment of DNA, synthesize maybe many of them, put them together, assemble them together, and then swap them through a different kind of enzymes into the elephant genome. So these are some of the tools we, we use now, but we're developing, optimizing uh, better tools for the future. So we'll, we'll wait and see. You mentioned earlier that kind of one of the, the genes that you're kind of looking at, um, 
are kind of trying to enable it um, to ena enable the mammals to kind of adapt to cold climates. Um, mm -hmm. Are you hoping to kind of look at any other sort sort of genes, and and why is it that you kind of selected those genes in in the first place? Yeah. Well, we selected those genes because they popped up when we did the comparison. And when we looked at the annotation of those genes and some other previous publications, um, th there is a strong indication that they might give us the phenotype uh, we see in the woolly mammals, such as cold resistance and hair um, and uh, brown fat de uh, deposits and so on. Um, but on top of that, we see a lot of changes in some of the regulatory region. So a gene, a coding region of a gene, we're specifically looking at coding regions, but we can extend that work into regulatory regions, regions that actually regulate the expression of a, any given gene. So we've seen some differences there, and actually we've seen a lot of genes that are unannotated. That means that we don't know the function uh, of those genes. Therefore, it would be very, very cool in the future to explore the role and the function of these of uh, what those genes do in the background of an elephant or woolly mammoth um, as we go along with our research. Yeah, but what it most excites me now is actually some of these regulatory regions and unannotated genes. What are the sort of traits you kind of hoping to then kind of put into this, this hybrid? Like what do you kind of want to produce as like the end goal? The phenotype of uh, cold resistance, of course, is, uh, is an absolute must. But we don't even know whether the genes we are going to edit are going to fully give us that phenotype. So the more changes you make, um, obviously, the, the closer you will get to the uh, woolly mammoth background. So we are looking at some, of, as I said, some of the easy picks, the low hanging fruit, uh, so to speak, and then extend that search um, to the, as I said, the un 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 unannotated genes and other, um, and other sequences. Uh, that we don't know the, yet the function of. But obviously, we're, we're going to definitely look into any gene that is, in, uh, is involved in the, the developmental process. Uh, we see uh, the elephants and the woolly mammals do have uh, changes or differences in their um, morphology, smaller ears, smaller stature, and so on. So obviously, we predict a lot of um, developmental genes to be involved there. So we will definitely look there. Are you looking at any sort of genes that could help it potentially be more resistant to, I don't know, the kind of climate that we're in now or more resilient or kind of give it yeah. an advantage essentially? Yeah, yeah. But we need, I think in order to achieve that, we also need a lot more information, um, for example, for um, the genes themselves. So for example, for uh, climate change, I suppose you can, uh, if you're going to do, if you're going to make a hybrid, uh, elephant woolly mammoth or LMF, um, maybe now that the climate is getting warmer, uh, potentially uh, you can look into uh, maybe preserving some of the, the adaptation that elephants have to warmer climates rather than, you know, um, conferring full cold resistance. But we'll have to see how the climate evolves by the time. <clears throat> We generate, um, uh, of course, uh, first the cells and then hopefully the full woolly mammoth. I think what would be cool is actually to engineer uh, vir uh, disease resistance uh, in the new um, woolly mammoths or hybrids. And for that, we'll probably need to know uh, a lot about what potentially could have affected the woolly mammoth, but also what affects uh, what diseases afflict the extant elephant species. And we know of one, such as the uh, elephant and the filiotropic herpes virus, which is fatal to young elephants. So we can potentially, and because of the sequences of the woolly mammoth and the Asian elephants are so close, uh, we might predict that um, a woolly mammoth might also be afflicted um, by infection with this virus. And so when you build or you engineer the genome of the hybrid or the woolly mammoth, we can, as we understand more of the diseases, we can engineer resistance uh, into the genome as well. Yeah, I mean, I read, I read kind of that you guys are working on kind of synthesizing the virulent herpes virus in, in vitro to yeah. kind of study it. Would you be able to just kind of expand on, on that area of research that you're looking into? Yeah, so first off, it's virulent uh, only in, uh, we would say, 
in uh, young elephants. I think uh, humans are fairly safe. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of uh, elephant handlers who deal with, uh, you know, elephants in the zoos, and we don't have any cases of transmission yet. And uh, adult elephants do very well as well uh, in general. So, and they shed this virus um, continuously called EHV. Um, again, uh, elephant endotheliotropic herp herpes virus. Um, something happens though that it, when it activates in young elephants between the ages of zero and, or at least uh, uh, neonates and uh, 10 or 12, if it activates, it's, uh, it's fairly fatal. So for the afflicted individuals, about two thirds of them die. Um, and so it's important to try to see try to diagnose the disease as uh, fast as possible because they might have a chance. Um, a lot of zoos, for example, do allocate resources to sequence the viral load of the, uh, of the virus in the young elephants continuously. And if they see spikes, they start treating with uh, antivirals and IV. And so that can, that can give young elephants a chance. But more often than not, they die because from the diagnosis or from the observation to death is a very short time frame. Um, it seems to afflict more elephants uh, in zoos than uh, in the wild, though of course cases in the wild have been uh, reported. It also seems to affect more Asian elephants than African elephants, although again, um, African elephant variants of EHV have also uh, caused um, African elephant deaths. And so we don't know much about the mechanism of disease. So we're hoping to use synthetic biology, building the genome of the virus and actually uh, studying it um, in, an, in a cellular model to find out the viral uh, life cycle and the proteins the, that it affects within or how the gene expression is affected within a cell. So basically, I mean, it's a, it's a disaster. It's a terrible disease. It causes, it perforates the uh, arteries and veins. So these uh, animals basically bleed, bleed out hemorrhage. And um, we know about sequences of um, variants of this virus, but we don't really know how to counter the disease. There are some efforts from the laboratory of Dr. Poling at Baylor. They're trying to, um, you know, study the sequences, potentially make a vaccine. Um, it's still work in progress. But we would also like to use our expertise um, and synthetic biology to build the genome and potentially find um, the right genome editing tools in order to treat um, these elephants um, in vivo, potentially with, with a, a vector like AAV carrying the gene editing tool and the guide RNA so it can chop up the virus, shred the virus and genome um, in vivo. Uh, those are obviously efforts for the future. We are currently working on it, but it will take uh, a little bit of time to make progress there. And obviously working with zoos and um, veterinarians to actually make it happen. It's not easy um, to establish protocols for exotic species. Yeah. How do you think this kind of research will then kind of impact conservation efforts? Um, for like Asian elephants? Yeah, so the more we know about the disease, as I said, we can actually engineer virus resistance even in elephants themselves. We don't actually only have to uh, engineer virus resistance in woolly mammoths or hybrids. So synthetic biology and uh, gene editing can be quite helpful in preservation of the species. Um, obviously we need to, a ton of resources and willingness to save the elephants in the wild, but we always need a backup plan because they are highly endangered. And so removing at least one um, uh, endangering factor like disease could be very, very important for preservation of the species. That's why we also work on the EHV, not just the revival of the woolly mammoth. That's really interesting. I mean, once you kind of once we kind of bring woolly mammoths back, how how well do we kind of know their ecosystem in terms of like, is their ecosystem like really, really different now compared to what it was? Like, is there some sort of like microorganism that we're not aware of that used to be there that kind of now isn't that kind of will impact the whole of the whole of the chain? Essentially? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. It's obviously well, though, extinct, though extinction happened fairly recently, um, 
compared to you know the age of the earth it's um it's still a thousand thousands of year, years have passed and uh, the flora and fauna have also changed now with the geoengineering so i'm a little bit um afraid to just use geoengineering because here we're not creating an artificial system we're actually trying to restore a natural system so it's not artificial it's just restoring what used to be there and with the efforts of the Zimovs uh, in Siberia, you can see that introducing more larger organisms um, into a patch of land, sort of like restore, uh, restores that grassland ecosystem that hap uh, happened or um, occurred during the Pleistocene time. So at least some of that biodiversity can be captured by introducing some of the species that used to be there. I mean, it used to be a very, very, very rich ecosystem. Uh, the Zimovs estimate up to 10 tons of, of mass, organic mass per square um, kilometer. So they estimate about one mammoth per square kilometer <laughs> that used to roam, uh, you know, the plains of uh, Siberia. Uh, so we know about the, from bone uh, collections, we know sort of like the large animals that existed there. Uh, but you are correct. We don't really know the micro or the full uh, gamut of the microorganisms that live there. One thing that can help is the metagenomics of the soil. So trying to sequence as, as much as possible and also sequence the guts of these well-preserved specimen. There have been a couple of studies there. Um, I'm not well versed in the field, but you can actually look at the, the using ribosomal RNA to sequence some of the microorganisms that live in the guts of these um, ancient species. And of course, trying to compare what used to be uh, a microorganism that lived thousands of years ago versus uh, you know, what's populating uh, or colonizing the gut post-death. Um, so there are definitely more, more studies need to be done there. But we can actually use this information from sequencing uh, to try to figure out um, you know, some of the uh, metagenomics biodiversity that existed at that time. But the truth of the matter is we don't really know. What we're hoping is that introducing these species, these larger um, organisms back in, uh, in you know, this huge habitat that basic, basically has um, next to no large animals, um, at least compared to what it used to be. I think you just have to let uh, nature run its course at that time, right? So you, you're worried about trying to, um, you know, make it as close as possible, but at the same time, you just have to let life happen. Um, uh, obviously under observation, we'll, we'll learn more as we observe what happens, but the fact that some more, so the fact that this uh, place to send park in Siberia does look more like uh, a grassland when you populate it with uh, animals like muskox, reindeer, yaks, moose, uh, that kind of gives us an indication that it's possible to restore it to a more biodiverse ecosystem it, that it used to be uh, a long time ago. Whether it will be fully captured like it used to be, that remains to be seen, potentially highly unlikely, but at least we can get very close. Could there be cases of where like um, mammoths get integrated and they kind of then make other organisms go extinct and they kind of ruin sort of other biodiversity in terms of like microorganisms? Like, I suppose that's going to be very difficult to, to monitor. Especially yeah, you'll have to, yeah, you'll have, you'll have, <laughs> have to, to do wait. that and then observe. <laughs> but as I mentioned, uh, it used to be um, places in the grasslands, the, the mammoth uh, steppe, used to be very di biodiverse, as I mentioned. A lot of large organisms living in the same square kilometer, right? It's very, very dense. So it's highly unlikely that the mammoths themselves would cause the extinction of any other species. Uh, species, I mean, there is competition, right? If there isn't enough, uh, if, you know, if there, are, if there isn't enough grass, of course, maybe you'll see some of the larger species go uh, extinct. Again, it's hard to, to kind of like model it perfectly right now. Um, it's certainly a danger, but it has, it will have to be gradual as well. Um, and also, of course, um, you know, usually a, a species expands um, depending on the, the uh, nature and the environment surrounding it. So obviously if there aren't that many resources for it to survive, 
it will, you know, the ecosystem will not be as dense. I think one hypothesis is that it was humans that kind of um, hunted a lot of mammals and, and with the loss of the woolly mammoth, which, you know, trampled snow, allowed for this uh, grassland ecosystem to happen, the, the land froze very quickly and therefore all the, gradually all the other uh, animals were lost. Um, so we can say the opposite, that the loss of the woolly mammoth actually contributed to the loss of biodiversity um, we see now. But again, a lot of it is also speculation. So we don't know until we actually try. But we, it's hard to know, or it's, it's hard to see how a reintroduction of the woolly mammoth would have many negative effects. You know, it used to be their ecosystem, their habitat. They are large species. It's, it's very easy to track them, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, even if there are negative effects from reintroduction in the wild. Um, and I, they have a very, very long gestation time. They won't populate uh, the area as fast as, uh, as we think. So there's plenty of time for observation. Their gestation time is uh, almost two years. So <laughs> yeah. I think the problem would be to actually have more rather than fewer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we definitely won't miss them <laughs> they're very yeah. large but what <laughs> right. do you kind of think the future of this field is like and what are you kind of excited about as well yeah i think uh it's very exciting to me that we have the possibility of restoring lost species uh, and that it won't i mean right now it might take us decades but in the future once we reach that inflection point we can make um or we can design um synthesize and assemble the genome of any species um, because synthetic biology has advanced and will continue to advance a lot. Um, again, with this power, there comes great responsibility. So we'll have to have those ethical uh, discussions of what we do uh, when we are so powerful as to make uh, these genomes um, very quickly. Um, but as, a, as an animal lover, I think it really excites me that I can use um, science and technology to restore some of the balance uh, of the ecosystems. Every day we are faced with, um, you know, loss of biodiversity and trying to preserve that for ourselves and for Earth. I think it's as cliche and as uh, hackneyed, hackneyed as it sounds. I think it's it's very important. Studying species, studying the biodiversity has helped us as a species quite a lot. And so, um, I feel like it's only beneficial to try to keep uh, our earth as biodiverse as possible. And if we have to use some of the artificial tools to do so, so be it. <laughs> <laughs> Provided it is, of course, it's in an ethical and uh, um, well-discussed manner. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ariana. It's been it's been really interesting, and I and I can't wait to see kind of the progress that your that your group makes as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shannon. It's been a pleasure. I hope. Uh, people look more into it, they get more excited uh, about it, and they don't necessarily fear science, um, but rather actually use it to our uh, benefit. Um, and hopefully we'll see woolly mammoths roam again uh, in Siberia. <laughs> Actually, thank you. <laughs>